Hi, everybody. Today we'll be discussing on renal replacement therapy and I'll be doing it in multiple parts because it's a very big topic. So today we will discuss the indications for renal replacement therapy and for indications also I will be discussing in detail in one more class. Today I'll be mainly concentrating on the different principles behind renal replacement therapy and what are the different modalities. You must have heard of so many confusing names. Um, CVV, HD, CVV, HF, CVV, HDF, all different alphabets that are put together. So let us simplify things so that you understand what you're seeing or what you're doing. This is uh, just an intro about how much is the burden of acute kidney injury in critically ill children and young adults. This is one of the biggest prospective trials, multicentral trials of which India was also a part. This was done by AWARE group of investigators and what they saw was in critically ill children, nearly 27% had acute kidney injury, 11.6% had acute kidney injury and it directly correlated with mortality. The severity directly correlated with mortality with a 1.7 odds ratio at 28 days. But having said that, if you try to define this acute kidney injury by means of creat, which is what our... Um, you know, criteria, standard criteria of uh, rifle, kidigo, DAS, you will miss out on nearly 67% of the chunk of population with acute kidney injury. So why is that? The reason is, see, creatinine is not a reliable marker because it takes time to rise in your blood. Okay, it's not just uh, one mechanism of excretion of creatinine. Okay, so even if the patient is aneuric today, the creatinine might rise two to three days later. So even if you have a low urine output, you cannot rely on this creatinine to say, oh, okay, creatinine is just 1.2, I will pay it. So in that case, you will miss out. That is why the importance of biomarkers have started improving. Renal angina index, they are giving more and more importance to those. There are renal and non-renal indications. Renal are the classical indications that you know of when there is a significant fluid overload. It's either fluid or electrolytes. Okay, for fluid, there is significant fluid that is present, which the patient is not able to get out, and that is causing compromise in the form of pulmonary edema. Or it's a uh, electrolyte or some extra substance in the fluid. So electrolyte is going to be your potassium. That is what you are most worried about. The other substances are acids, significant metabolic acidosis, which is refractory to metab metabolic therapy, so too much urea, which is causing an organ dysfunction like a pericarditis, or extra substance that is not supposed to be there at all in the body, like your toxins. So this is classical. All of us know that there are other non-renal indications that renal replacement therapy is being used for. Just a second. So the non-renal indications are severe sepsis and shock, multi-organ dysfunction, permanent hepatic failure, ARDS, heart failure, severe pancreatitis. So these are all indications that deserve time to discuss, which we'll be doing it in next class. So if you talk about different modalities, you can do using peritoneal membrane as the dialysable membrane, or you can use an artificial membrane, which you use in intermittent hemodialysis. Uh, PIRRT, which is prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy, or continuous. Okay, so as the name suggests, the duration differs. Okay, for in intermittent hemodialysis, that will be the shortest one. Whereas continual renal replacement therapy, it is meant to work on a continuous basis. Okay, so today we will try to restrict ourselves to CRRT. The principles, if you understand this, you can apply to others also. So the basic set up for any renal replacement therapy is you have a hemodialysis catheter in place. One serves as the outlet port. Okay, it comes out and goes into the filter. Once whatever needs to be removed is removed and then it goes back into patient. Okay, it is as simple as that. Okay, so it is just a single one. There are no two ports here. Okay, it's just a single catheter and it has got two holes in it, one distal and one proximal. Okay, blood goes out, pump pulls it out, gets it into the uh, filter and after filtration, it gets back into the patient. 
So there are four major principles that we have to know. Okay, one is diffusion, convection, adsorption, and ultrafiltration. So we will talk about the easiest one first, and then we will move on. Ultrafiltration means removal of water. It is as simple as that. Okay, you have blood. You have the filter membrane on the on the other side. Uh, you have whatever fluid, and your water excess water will move from your blood through the semi permeable membrane to the other side. Okay, the blue dots are the water molecules. Okay, so as the name suggests, ultra filtration. It's only water removal. So for this water to move from one compartment to another, you need a pressure gradient. So where do you use it? So if you think about it logically, wherever there is fluid overload, you are going to use this. Correct. Next, convection. Here also, you have movement of fluid from your blood compartment into other compartment, and along with the movement of water through the semi-permeable membrane, it drags out solutes also. Okay, so it's called a solute drag. So when the solute Drag is dependent upon water movement from one place to another. It requires a pressure gradient. Correct. The pressure gradient is, uh, it cannot be provided just by your uh, blood pressure alone. So you need to add some other pressure head. So here, you will add extra fluid to the system so that it creates the pressure difference for the fluid to move and for it to drag the solutes along. Okay. So if somebody is saying, I'm using convection, that means they are using something called as a replacement fluid. Okay, here both fluid and solutes are removed and smaller and larger solutes are also removed. Okay, so this is about convection. Next is diffusion. Diffusion also same. You from one area to another area through a semi-permeable membrane. But here the movement is by the solutes by means of concentration difference. Okay, so only if you establish a concentration difference on either side of the membrane, then from higher concentration to lower concentration, your solute is going to move. So here, what do you need? You need to have a solution that has a very low concentration. Correct. Of the things that you want to remove from blood. So here, you use a dialyzing fluid. Okay. And since it is concentration dependent, only smaller molecules move from your blood to the dialysate membrane. Okay, clear? So diffusion, if somebody is saying diffusion, it means they are trying to remove small molecules and it is movement by means of concentration difference. And to create that concentration difference, you need a dialysate fluid. Next. So when you say concentration difference, you can create concentration difference by two means. One is called as a co-current flow. The other one is called as a counter-current flow. So what does it mean? It is very simple. Okay, Don't get confused. You have blood moving in one direction. If the dialysate move, fluid is also moving in the same direction, that is called as co-current flow. Okay. So what happens? Initially, the concentration in blood is highest, around 30. Okay. Next, if you see simultaneously on the dialysate side, the concentration is nil. So there's a huge concentration difference to start with. What happens? So you start moving from your uh, blood to your dialysate fluid. Then if you move down, there is a little bit less concentration difference, less concentration difference, less concentration difference. because So let's keep moving from your blood to the dialysate fluid. So after a certain point in time, there's not much of concentration difference at all. So there's no movement of solutes. Correct? So across the whole of filter, you may not have the movement of solutes. That is what I'm trying to tell you in a co-current flow. Whereas in a counter-current flow, what happens? You initially have a concentration difference and the concentration difference keeps maintaining throughout the membrane because it moves in opposite direction. Okay. So here, say you have 15 of concentration. Here you have zero. On top, if you see blood is coming in, it has 30 of whatever is not required. And the dialysate has some 15 because from here, from down, it has taken the 15 from the blood. Correct. Even though it has got some amount of solute, the concentration difference is there. 
So always the bad solutes or what is not required keep moving into the dialysate fluid throughout the membrane. So which is better if you think counter current flow is better compared to your co current flow. Studies also have shown if you use a counter current flow for a patient who has you know acute kidney injury, there is a twenty percent better removal of urea and creatinine. Okay, adsorption as the name suggests, it's basically your solute or whatever matter like cytokines etc. gets attached to the semi permeable membrane. Okay, so. It is not movement from one area to another. It is just pachatpain to the filter. It is there. Okay. So the membrane has to have adsorptive tendency. Okay. So high level of absorption, if it is there, it can cause the filter to clog and clot and it can become ineffective over time. That is something you have to remember. All right. So these are the four major principles. You have ultra filtration where just water was removed. If you add, if you want to add solute removal, then you do something called as a convection. No, 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 no. I want to remove only solutes, not much of fluid I want to remove. And I want to do a concentration dependent uh, movement, then it will be a diffusion. Adsorption is adsorption. Okay, so I kept on telling small molecule, large molecule, medium molecule. This is a table that will give you what are all the small molecules and middle molecules and large molecules. Remember these small molecules. Small molecules is generally what you are generally concerned with. Your urea, creatinines, your electrolytes, potassium, sodiums, phosphorus. All of those are small molecules. Okay. So if you want to look at a filter setup for an ultra filtration, so this they have used um, a different, how to tell, arteriovenous sort of uh, attachment. But the principle remains same. Okay, blood comes out of the patient, goes into a filter, and whatever extra fluid you have set to be removed will be removed, and it goes out into the effluent bag, the yellow color bag. Okay, and the rest of the blood goes back into the patient. So this is ultra filtration. Okay, the process of removal of just fluid. The principle is ultra filtration. The modality is called as slow continuous ultra filtration. Okay. Next, I will go through these types of RRT and we will go back to that. Okay. If you put convection on the left, convection is also named as filtration here, HF. Diffusion is also named as dialysis here, HD. Okay. So anything that uses convection to remove just fluid is called as cuff. Okay. Slow continuous ultra filtration. If you want to remove fluid and solutes, that is CVVH continuous veno venous chemo filtration. Okay, these are all modalities of continuous renal replacement therapy. Remember that I'm stressing it again and again. It is CRRT. If you want to say I am going to remove solutes, and solute is my target removing thing, then it is going to be CVVH continuous veno venous chemo dialysis. It uses the principle of diffusion. If you're saying, no, I want this also, I want that also, I want fluid, I want molecule, I want small, I want middle large, all of that put together, it will become CVV HDF. It uses both convection and diffusion principle. Okay. So let us look at the filter setup now. Ultra filtration, we finished. Correct. This is cuff. Next is continuous veno venous hemofiltration. What did we talk about for convection? This uses the principle of convection. And to use principle of convection, you need a pressure difference. And for pressure difference, you need to add an extra fluid to create that pressure difference, which is called as replacement fluid. This is what is seen here. So blood comes out, replacement fluid is added, creates a pressure difference. Okay, whatever needs to be removed is removed into this effluent yellow bag, and the rest goes back into the patient. You remember this much, that is more than enough for you. If I am telling continuous venovenous hemodialysis, so this works on the principle of diffusion. Correct? For diffusion, you need a concentration gradient. To create a concentration gradient, you need a dialysate fluid which is of low concentration. Correct? So here you have access, blood is coming out, you have a dialysate fluid which is flowing like this, creating a countercurrent flow. Whatever is not needed gets removed to the effluent bag and the 
cleaned blood or the filtered blood goes back or returns to the patient. Okay, here there is no use of replacement fluid. There is no need for any substitution solution. Okay. Hemo diafiltration. Here you are using both this and that, both convection and diffusion. So you need to add a replacement fluid in the green and in the blue, a dialysate fluid. Whatever is not required or filtered out gets collected in the effluent back, then the blood goes back into the patient. Okay. So these are all the modalities that you have to remember. And if somebody is asking you principles, how do you classify modalities of RRT? This is what you will be expected to write. For types of RRT, you need to talk about the peritoneal dialysis intermittent, um, hemodialysis, then your PIRRT and CRRT. Okay. I think this is enough for today. Thank you and bye-bye.